Our next guest uh, comes to us all the way from the CCA galleries. Um, curator and architect Mirko Zardini is the director of the CCA since 2005. And uh, he has been working through publications and exhibitions like uh, Sense of the City, Sensation Urbaine, and uh, Sorry Out of Gas, uh, Désolé Plus d'Essence, questioning uh, the basic assumptions on which architecture and architects operate today. In fact, I think he's now questioned most of them. Um, but if there are any assumptions left, I think he's going to question them tonight. If we could please welcome Mirko Zardini. Uh, generally, I don't uh, have title, but uh, for tonight, I thought uh, could be nice to have a title for my presentation. And the title uh, is uh, uh, Seven Stories I Do Not Like to Tell, But uh, I Have to Tell. And the first story is, is about um, a story starting on August 9, 1993. Clio Cut Sound in Vancouver, British Columbia, was uh, the site of a mass protest against clear cutting loggings of old growth forest. In that occasion, police arrested more than 200 people. 45 protesters were given 45 days prison sentences. But uh, this protest served uh, as a model for uh, activism, including the actions leading uh, to the Great Beer Rainforest Agreement, uh, which was uh, signed uh, this year and now protects uh, 6.4 million uh, hectares in British Columbia of uh, a temperate uh, rainforest. Since uh, Europeans contact in 16th century, images of lush and wild landscapes have been embedded in the perception that we have of Canadian environments. Today, Canada offers, on the contrary, a remarkable contrast between uh, the idealized vision of a pristine natural environment and the reality of a land stripped of all value except uh, an economic one. A real uh, exemplary case study in the history of uh, progress. 1976, the Payark, an experimental autonomous house, was built uh, on Prince Edward Island by the new Alchemy Institute, funded by the Canadian government. The project combined uh, organic farming, solar algae tanks for aquaculture, solar and wind energy to set a kind of a precedent for self-sustainable architecture. Opened by Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, in the helicopter, uh, and the Premier Alice Campbell. The building served as a research center for a decade before it was decommissioned and eventually demolished uh, for lack uh, of uh, funding. Same period, same time, mismanagement of commercial fishing uh, on the Atlantic coast rapidly uh, depleted the cod population. Uh, the grand banks once accounted for 46% of total available cod worldwide. Uh, in 1977, the annual catch of northern cod in zone 21 on the uh, Canadian Atlantic coast measured about uh, 235,000 tons. Six years later, 1983, the figure was more than doubled. Following decades of overfishing, a July 1992 moratorium put a sudden halt to overconsumption and all commercial fishing. Originally instated for two years, the, then it was extended until today. The moratorium claimed 40,000 jobs across five Canadian provinces and is still in effect today. Cod population have only recently started to recover. The week of uh, 12 May 2000, 
uh, was uh, the week that Health Canada declared Safe Drinking Water Week. In the same week, heavy rains caused a deadly strain of E. coli to enter the city drinking water in Walker Town, Ontario. It was considered at the time, and perhaps today, the worst modern day waterborne disease outbreak. Seven people were killed, 2,000 fell ill, leading to 95 days of court hearings and 20,000 pages of transcript that we didn't look at for the moment. In, dec in the decade leading up to the catastrophe, more relevant, Walker Town's water tested positive for contamination on over 100 different occasions. 2015, 1,838 drinking water advisory were listed across Canada, 10 provinces and three territories. 20% of all First Nation communities across Canada were subject to drinking water advisories, many of these having been in place for 5 to 15 years. Beginning uh, uh, 1926, that is a long story, an international settlement between the uh, US and Canada first recognized the capacity of air pollution to harm environments at a greater distance from an industrial source, in that case, a trail of British Columbia. Half a century later, in the 1970s, INCO erected a super stack here, Sudbury, in an effort to intentionally disperse its industrial emission beyond the Sudbury area in Ontario. It worked very well. The small stacks, the tallest in the world at the time of its construction, extended damage throughout a much greater territory, and the environmental impact from emission became more difficult to track. By 1984, 1,400 lakes had been declared dead surrounding Sudbury area, and tens of thousands more at risk. The Canadian Coalition on Acid Rain was founded in 1981 during a rising concern over the widespread acidification of soils and lakes in central and eastern Canada. The coalition lobbied both in Canada and in the United States for greater regulations of industrial emission. Following the passing of the U.S. Clean Air Act in the 1990s, it disbanded. September 1971, 16 activists set sail from Vancouver in an old fishing boat renamed the Greenpeace, bound from Amchitka Island off the Alaskan coast, where the U.S. military had been conducting nuclear weapons tests. The Greenpeace was intercepted by the U.S. Navy before it could reach the testing site, and the small group had to turn back. Many in the group considered that voyage to be a real failure, but the event stimulated a greater increase in public awareness. Not only did the U.S. Army cancel the Amchitka test program five months later, but was, this action was the beginning of uh, today's most widely known environmental organization with uh, 2.9 million uh, of members working out of 55 countries. Manly Natlands 1958 proposal expected the heat from the detonation of a nuclear bomb in Athabasca, underground explosion, to melt the tar sands, producing the liquid hydrocarbons that could then be easily extracted by way of conventional drilling. The plan was approved by the U.S. Congress Atomic Energy Commissions, Mines Branch of the Atomic Energy of Canada, the Defense Research Board in Ottawa, and the province of Alberta. Prime Minister John Diefenbaker, however, terminated the project in 1962 with mounting anti-nuclear public pressure. September 1973, two ships collided at the entrance of a Burrard Inlet in Vancouver and releasing a kind of estimated 
190,000 liters of light bunker oil into the water. Today, Kinder Morgan's proposal Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion would nearly triple the volume of diluted Alberta bitumen being pumped to Vancouver's coastline and cause a seven-fold increase in tanker traffic in waters of southern BC. In the 70s and the 80s, increasing public awareness of the problems associated with the use of fossil fuels led architects to explore alternative ways of generating energy. The Lorin House was one of these projects. It was designed in 1981 by Pierluccio Pellissier and Giovanni De Paoli. Heating uh, the building is provided by direct radiation into the sun space on the southern edge of the house. Passive solar energy contributed 50% of the annual gross heating of the home, according to a 1984 solar energy program report. As early as uh, 1946, uh, the US Air Force had proposed a defensive line of radar stations to span the northern edge of North America, a system that would be capable of detecting Soviet planes. Of the 63 radar stations, 42 were within Canadian territory. Today, the legacy of the defensive radar sites have been left uh, northern soils contaminated by PCBs and inorganic compounds, including asbestos, lead, mercury, and oil. 1996, the Department of National Defense consented to the cleanup of 21 sites within its control. The cleanup project lasted two decades and concluded in 2014. At the end, there is a very general question. What is left of our traditional idea of Canada as a place of undisturbed wilderness? A famous architect, belonging to the Team 10, Giancarlo De Carlo, once said, architecture is too important to be left to the architects. And uh, I would like to say that uh, environment too is too important to be left to environmentalists. I think that each of us can contribute to a discussion, a reflection, and some action about that. Every discipline can contribute to a different approach to environmental crisis. How do we start? We must perhaps question our relationships to the environment shaped by a very clear modern idea of progress based uh, on uh, consumption. And um, we can perhaps start uh, telling different uh, stories about the environment, telling for the first time some uh, real or uh, true stories about the environment. Thanks.